Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of PI Perspectives. Matt had so much fun in Colorado, he decided to stick around and speak to another Rocky Mountain investigator. This week, Rod Gagnon from Recovery Analytics LLC joins the show. Rod's the guy you want to talk to when you have a judgment you want to try and recover, or you need to trace financial records. He started off repossessing cars and moved into distressed asset recovery. This episode is brought to you by Crosstracks Case Management Software. Crosstracks now offers CTX Vision, a fully integrated video conferencing platform built into Crosstracks. The videos you host go directly into your video tab. Crosstracks also integrates with programs you already use like QuickBooks, DelphPoint, ScopeNow, Investigation Video Editor, Word, and more. The integrations combined with powerful features such as automated audio transcription and report generation help investigators generate revenue and improve efficiency. The system can be customized for any investigative specialty. Start your free trial today at crosstracks.co and use promo code PIP20. The next issue of PI Magazine is hot off the presses. Make sure you visit PIMagazine.com for all the details. Check out Matt's column on Podcasting 101 and PI Perspectives. It's back to the Mile High City to chat with Rod Gagnon and our host, private investigator Matt Spare. And welcome everybody to the next episode of PI Perspectives. This is Matt Spare, your host. Today I'm very excited to go back to Colorado two weeks in a row here, and it just happened to work out that way. So today we are talking to Rod Gagnon from Recovery Analytics, LLC. I heard Rod on a podcast for John Hoda back uh, beginning of the year, and I thought that the subject matter was very interesting and was interested in bringing him on board. We uh, connected recently, and, and I invited him on the show, so here we are today. Rod, welcome to the program. How are you? Hi, doing great. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, thanks for uh, for joining us today to talk about this stuff. So we're we're going to talk about financial research, but before we get into that, tell me a little bit about your company and your background and how you got into this business. Okay, uh, Recovery Analytics is a more specialized than post judgment enforcement. So that we we have done some pre litigation work. Most of it is actually post judgment enforcement, uh, which means we go through the courts to help get all the assets and stuff. My history has gone back. I think it was in the mid '80s. I started a repossession company, and that got me down the path of the uh, distressed assets. We did really well with that in uh, New Hampshire. We ended up building a pretty good size agency up there, working for all the finance companies and the banks. And I probably learned more about pre no, yeah, pretexting and how to deal with people in stressful environments and in doing that business. So it was very, very valuable. But uh, over the years, I've moved over more to the white collar side of distressed assets, certified fraud examiner. And I've done a lot of, well, like I said before, I've done some expert witness work and some witness work with law firms in different cases all across the U.S. So it's been, been quite a ride, but at least now I'm on the, the side where I don't have to go out in the middle of the night. I'm sure your wife appreciates that, right? You have no idea. <laughs> I actually do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think most of us do, right? Unless our spouse is in the game here too, when they're the, the, the husband and wife team. Um so right. you, you have a strong business background, right? Um, uh, as far as your education um, and and the, the banking, so um, you had that strong foundation c- coming into it. What led you to decide um, being a certified fraud examiner and, and and the numbers and the dollars and all that? What really attracted you about that? Well, I, I think it was a, a natural progression based on what I was good at. So when I first got into investigations, it was in the early years. Besides the asset recovery part. I also did a lot of corporate due diligence work. And I found that I really enjoyed that, the research. So there were the the investigators that were really good at thinking on their feet, being out in the field, uh, you know, the uh, uh, bail bonds recovery work or the surveillance work. And I would just found that was not that was not a fit for me. I mean, if I did surveillance, I would never inevitably fall asleep, you know, in the car. So it wasn't uh, I wasn't that fast thinker, but when it came to being in front of a computer or going through public records uh, or looking for a pattern in, in large, large amounts of data, that fit perfectly for me, um, uh, puzzle solving work. So over time, I, basically the agency, you know, had in the beginning, our PI agency had more general stuff, a lot of background checks um, and that kind of stuff and corporate due diligence. But over time, what I really liked was that uh, the financial side. I found I was really, really good at finding people and I was really, really good at following money. So in the end, it just 
that's the area that I just end up focusing on. So it took me a while to figure out what I like uh, in the field because there's just so much in investigations that one can focus on. Big, big thing here, right? We can do many things that a private investigator can do, actually. That's right. So that's so in the beginning, I mean, we do have a, a background of the criminal record searches and the background checks. And I went through my phases of being able to do a lot of that. But, you know, over time, this this is an area that uh, I excelled and had a lot of fun. A lot, of, a lot of fun doing this stuff. So who would you say are your primary clients? Is it pretty much attorneys you work with, or do you work with other investigators that are looking to have um, this financial research done? Uh, occasionally, I'll get you know referral from uh, other investigators, which is always appreciated. But I have to say, most of the time, almost all our work is directly with law firms, or we go into the courts, and there's so much work. I mean, every single month, the courts are awarding judgments. And that's, that's where we start. You know, once we have the power of the court to recover things and subpoena things, that's, so there's an unlimited amount of work if, uh, if you don't have any clients. So you could pretty much drop a financial investigator anywhere. And as long as they get to a court, they can be back into work within a, within a month. Wow. So, uh, so how, yeah. it, how is uh, COVID-19 affecting your business and where the courts being closed and all that? So what does it look like for you trying to get work done these days? Yeah. So, it hasn't, it hasn't because the courts is, are set up where they have a skeleton crew and they can at least do some basic filing, electronic filing of motions and stuff. So the lawyers I work with will file the motions electronically. We could still do some, let's say, uh, going to go take some bank accounts. Uh, we can still generally do that. Uh, but anything that, that's going to be a hearing, we can't do it. We can't do any debtors exams. Um, anything that's going to trigger an event uh, isn't going to happen for months. But there's still a lot of work that we can that we still are able to get done. The research, um, you know, the that other stuff. So we're not completely dead in the water. It, we do get a lot done, but I can't wait till the courts are back open because that means we'll be able to uh, get a lot more done. Yeah, I think we're all in that same boat. So, do you see like the potential for having those debtor uh, exams like online um, through video conferencing? Do you see like that being the future of where things are going? No, I. Uh, I don't think I don't see for us the debtors exam is more it's a, it's a tactic okay it's not it's not really a legal event like let's say a lawyer would be looking at okay right. for us it's I'm bringing you into court because the court's an intimidating place and I'm going to have a court reporter there who's going to write down every single thing you say and I'm going to keep looking at the court reporter and you're going to see me looking at the court reporter right. so and and it's used to set up for let's say you're going to file bankruptcy down the road and I want to be able to use some of the lies against you. So do you okay, think, so do you that, think these folks lie a lot during these events? Like uh, oh, a, a hundred percent of the time. Really? <laughs> I don't know if you ever watched. <laughs> oh, uh, I forgot. I, I forgot. <laughs> I forgot I have that account. Yeah. I don't know if you ever watched Dr. House um, when it was on TV. Yeah, sure. One of his, yeah. One of his famous sayings was they all lie. Uh, and that, that is the case with, with this, the, because you, you're talking about the people that you're dealing with, that go into the court are the people that got to the end. Right. Of the legal process, yeah. they're that they're that ten percent that uh, would not settle, uh, refuse to settle, or uh, because they're not they won't pay anybody. So you're dealing with the hardest people to deal with, anyways. So most honest people, you know, are are settling out long before. So yeah, so they they as we like to say they they all lie, uh, but that's okay because um, part of our tactic is. Them having to take the time to come into court, intimidation right. of the court process itself, right. documenting everything, and be able to use it later. I mean, as a collection tool, it's terrible. Right. But as a, a, a tool for setting up later on, it it's, can be very good. Well, you get that gotcha moment. I mean, uh, I, I remember uh, completely unrelated, but going in and testifying in court um, with regards to a witness statement that I'd taken. And, uh, and they took me off the stand and then they brought in the guy who I took the statement from and the guy's like, Oh, he never told me who he was or he had never identified himself properly. And this was a, a, a cold interview. I went in to go to get the witness statement and, uh, they let the guy testify. He got off the stand. They brought me back on for cross and then they had me authenticate an audio recording that I had taken. It shows me like identifying myself, uh, offering to mail him a copy. And he says like, oh, I have a copier right here. And you can actually hear the copier machine in the background going, you know, like uh, making the copy. And, uh, you know, it's uh, the big gotcha right. moment for me was uh, pretty awesome. We have a form of that. So, for example, it, it, it depends what we're trying to do. Okay. Like, let's say uh, my goal is to 
set up the impression in front of the judge that they are they're not telling the truth. So I may come out and say, because the whole point of this is, in most asset recovery cases, the lawyers are doing, the very first thing they're doing is debtor's exam. Where with us, the last thing that we're doing is debtor's exam. Because we're not going in there unless we have already have all the answers. Okay. So we'll, I will sit there and we'll ask them, um, hey, you know, do, you own, do you own any recreational vehicles? You own, do you own a boat? No, nope, don't own a boat. Well, so that's very strange. What about this registration for a boat? Oh, that's oh, yeah. my that's my brother's. Boat. I forgot about that one. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> do you have Do you have any other property? No, no. Don't have any other property. Well, that's weird. You got this land up in the mountains. Uh, oh, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's my wife's. That's my wife's land. So what happens is after doing this like three times, um, you know, I want to let's say what I really want to know is I want to know about the offshore bank account, and then I'll say I'll hold up you know a piece of paper doesn't have anything on it, and I'll say, well, you know, do you have any offshore bank accounts? I'm looking at the paper, but at this point, they've already been embarrassed in front of the judge at least three times. Yeah, right. You know, so it, it for a setup like that, um, it's like I said, it's much more tactical right. than it is uh, assuming these people are going to tell you anything. I can only imagine how that goes down in federal court with the judges that were very intolerant to that kind of <laughs> shenanigans going on. Yeah, yeah, and generally, with it doesn't take too long before I think the judge can tell what what side is a good side and what side is the person not telling the truth. At least I hope to, I hope so. Right, exactly. Okay, so we're going to jump out real quick for a sponsor break. And when we come back in, I want to talk a little bit more about this. Uh, and we'll dig in and just understand maybe some of the terminology that, that folks may not be familiar with. Basically, talking about what happens when your attorney client calls you and says, I got to find uh, bank account information. And, and we'll talk ethics a little bit about uh, what, sure. what you should and shouldn't do and, and all that stuff. So, um Everybody uh, sit tight. We're going to jump out real quick and we'll be right back. This episode is sponsored by Scope Now. Have you tried Scope Now 3.0 yet? Scope Now offers a state of the art platform with the power and speed of automated intelligence. Visit scopenow.com for more details. Use code PIP20 to receive additional benefits. Are you ready for the future of networking and learning for private investigators? Imagine an online community with a vast amount of training and resource material. What if we told you some of the best content and technology providers will give you discounts and benefits for signing up? Get ready for the investigators-toolbox.com. Online soon at investigators-toolbox.com. And welcome back. Uh, we're back here with Rod Gagnon from Recovery Analytics in Denver, Colorado. Rod, welcome back to the program. Thank you. Before we took our break, we started getting into um, you know the financial research, basically your tactics and things that you do. Um, so let's let's break it down to the, to the layman's uh, term because yeah, you know, there are many investigators that that start and get into this business and don't really understand what financial research is and what the parameters and the limits that we have are here. So break it down real simple for me, and then we'll, we'll dig into it a little bit further. Sure. I mean, I think part of the, the frustration can be anybody that comes from general investigations, let's say due diligence, corporate due diligence is an excellent base to come into this. But if they don't have a legal side of it, if you, you, know, if you don't know um, the laws of the state, it makes it difficult because then it's hard to recommend you know, garnish this, levy this, do this. So there's that other part of the learning that does come into it. So there's a bit of a, a learning curve. So it's more than just corporate due diligence as applied to you know, a court case. Uh, but for us, everything is 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 timeline-based, okay? So if you did a background check, that's going to be a siloed investigation, right? It's right now, how many times, you know, what, what does he have against that person for uh, criminal action, civil action? You know, the background check is everything as of today. Whereas with us, it's all timeline. I want to know that when you knew you were going to get sued, how did your behavior change? Okay, all of a sudden the boat gets, gets you know, sold to the brother. All of a sudden, the, you know, the cabin gets uh, quick claim to a, a, a cousin. Um, and we are looking for that behavior because the, the court does allow us to be able to go back in there and roll those back. Uh, but if you don't know about them, right. uh, if you don't know how to go back in and be able to set it up on the timeline, and it's really interesting because when you throw in all that public record that's available out there, you put everything on the timeline, it comes right out exactly what the person did. It's it's like I said, if you get the patience for it, 
it's very fun watching these patterns come out because they tend to repeat. Yeah, I think they call it, uh, for businesses anyways, like piercing the corporate veil, right? If someone has a corporation, they're getting sued, and they said, okay, well, I'm no longer ABC uh, Corporation. Now I'm 123 Corporation, well, right? Well, that that's that's more older um, process. It, now, people still do it. Corporate. The problem with corporate veil stuff is it it's expensive and takes a long time to go through and prove that to the judge. So what we use, we use a different process uh, with fraudulent transfers. Uh, I think now they call avoidable transfers. So it's it's there's a whole list of things like did you sell it for you know very little money? Did you do it very quickly, like outside of the normal scope of how long it would tell it take you to sell something? You know, did you sell it to an associate or to an unknown person? There's a whole list of things, and we if you can go in as many of those things that we can prove, uh, we can go in front of the judge and say, look, you know, they, this is deed to the to the wife. We'd like to have it, you know, uh, dismissed. Um, and here is the whole list of, of stuff that was violated, you know, uh, so we can get our avoidable uh, transfer, the whole thing voided. So we go down that path instead of corporate, uh, right. corporate veil stuff. Right. Um, Would I mean, you some say, people still do it. It's just easier to go the other route. Right. Would you say the success rate on that is, is higher using those tactics? Much, much higher. And, and it's, and it's almost like with the judge, the judge can, in most cases knows that the person has done wrong. And as you know, they knew we were coming, and they just, uh, just you know, distributed everything. And they they want to be a, the ammunition to be able to you know be able to give us what we want. But if we don't line it up for them, they can't. So with that, it makes it easy. So the more things I can give them, the um, the harder it makes it to be able to uh, get overturned. Right. So, and and so you've been doing this for a while, and you were talking about old ways of doing things and new ways of doing things. How have you seen? Um, the tactics and the information available change over the time that you've been doing this type of work? Well, it's definitely gotten a lot more sophisticated. Most times the lawyers are not trained in asset recovery, but there's more that are starting to get into it and understand it. I mean, the, the average business model is, is to take the retainer and do process the case and try to get a settlement, you know, try to get it up there before that, before it turns into a judgment. And then post judgment, they really, most of them don't know what to do. Right. So it's become, more of the online stuff, uh, data has gotten better. The resources has gotten better, which is good because, you know, in this case where you're dealing with somebody who is lying to the, to the court, we need every tool we can get. So the tools are, I mean, I, I could almost not do this 20 years ago. Not that I couldn't. It was just took a lot more driving to the court, driving to the recorder's office. Sure. Uh, driving, but now, holy smokes, it's, uh, there's almost too much information out there. Yeah. You really have to know how to be able to, to target and go in and, and be able to put that timeline together. Yeah, we call it white noise, right? There's so much there. you got to cull through everything and, and figure out what's actually actionable and what's just uh, wasting time. Right? right, right. And there's also another part of it is I think um, sometimes investigators get really addicted to the online stuff uh, because it is so great. There's so much information in there. I mean, billions of data sets that they forget that there's another half of it, which is you really you need to get out. Right. You know, I'll do, I'll do drive-bys of the property, uh, especially on the weekend when they get the garage open, so I can see if that collectible car is <laughs> stuck in awesome. the back <laughs> that they, that they don't want to tell anybody about. Right. Or you go talk to to talk to certain people who, uh, you know, you get older people who are still not on the internet. You're just not going to get all the intel behind a computer. So a right. combination of the two, of uh, you know, some footwork and the data generally gets the best results. And I think so. I think we're, we've went into a problem where. There's a lot of investigators are very uh, computer centric, which I think yeah. is a little bit of a mistake. You know, that's a really, really good point, right? We we figure, you know, a lot of us get into that mindset of like, all right, I, I want to solve this problem and I want to move on to my next problem. But sometimes you're only solving it halfway. I think that that approach, what you're talking about is of, of doing the computer research, which is great, but you also right. got to do, you know, the the in-person stuff. I think that's, real, that's a good tip, man. That's really important to remember to do that. Um, yeah. So where do you see this industry going in the future? I think what's happening here is there is a vacuum that is, exists in the post-judgment world um, where some of the attorneys are getting it. Some of the attorneys, I actually heard an attorney tell another uh, somebody else, another person that, look, if you don't have a, an asset analyst, uh, your odds of being able to do recovery is going to be very small. And and when I when I say specifically an asset analyst, I'm talking about somebody. I'm not, I'm not saying an investigator. You can have an investigator who's an asset analyst, but 
but not all investigators are asset analysts because of the law side of it. Uh, that mix of the, of, of the lawyer and the asset analyst together as a team um, it, it is very, very powerful for being able to do post-judgment recovery. And more, most lawyers don't even know what an asset recovery analyst is. So the ones that are starting to find it out, I actually think that's what's going to happen. I think more people are going to come into this field. They're going to come and fill that void uh, and be able to help. I think there's a need. And I think there's been a need there for a long time. Yeah, I think you're right, man. I, I, I Just some content that's out there, some different podcasts uh, that I've listened to. There's a guy out there, um, Profit for Law, I think is one, uh, where it's, it's lawyer-driven. And he just recently did an, a, a whole uh, exchange on that, like, um, you know, making sure your support staff is doing you know, the, the best possible things they can do. And, and, and financial research was one of the things he was talking about, you know, just having a good um, ace in your hole, essentially. And it's, it's weird, too. Like, for me, uh, we had talked about this earlier um, o- offline, like my whole business is plaintiff personal injury, right? So if I'm getting involved in this, it's usually because there isn't a, a, a judgment that's been entered. Now they're looking to collect on it. They have no idea right. how this, how that works. Yeah, I had no idea That's at right. all. And a lot of them say, okay, how much is it going to cost? And then you give them, you know, the hit, no hit, you know, the time involved and all this other stuff. And they say, okay, we're going to go talk to our client because they're paying for it. And then we'll get back to you. And sometimes they right. do and sometimes they don't. So the attorneys don't even front that money. It's, it's actually the person who's already been screwed out of the money that they're supposed to get. Now they have to pay more to try and recover. It, it's, it's a very interesting dynamic the way that's set up. Right. Because of that, we've actually come up with some alternative solutions to be able to address that issue. So sometimes I'll have a, a law firm will call and say, give, give us a quote. And I know what they're doing. They're doing it because their client is coming back and saying, hey, you got the judgment a year ago, two years ago. What's going on? What's going on? And, and the lawyers are like, look, you know, they don't they don't know what to do after. They, they don't know what uh, what happened, where the funds went. So they're calling me to get the quote to be able to give it to them to basically keep them quiet. But um, it, it, which is kind of sad because if I could get, reach that client, I would give them alternatives. You know, I'd find out, look, what is it? What's the issue here? If you can't, if you're wealthy, the best thing you can do is a flat rate on an uh, asset investigation, financial forensic report, where it'll have all the information. That way you just pay me and then I'm gone. Okay. Um, but there are some people who've got some of the money and we'll break it down. We'll do get some of the stuff started, get the checklist of the garnishments and uh, the subpoena targets, and th- and then we switch over to phase two, which is contingency. We'll say, okay, we got to cover our costs to do the research in the beginning, but we'll be here long term for the different waves of subpoena documents that come back. Like, let's say we're going to analyze the bank statements, okay, to find out where everything went, and that's going to be a couple of iterations because we're going to follow that from bank to bank to bank. So we'll say, okay, we'll give us a, give us a percentage, not a huge percentage, but enough to make it worth everybody's time. Um, and let it, we'll take it, we'll take a part of it. So generally somewhere in that, in there, if we can find out what it is that the issue is, we can come up with a, uh, a payment process that fits everybody. Yeah. And I'm sure every state is different with what they're allowed to do too. Like in New York, private investigators are not allowed to be, uh, to do judgment recovery, right? We can find the money, but don't ask us to go get it. We can't do it. You have to go to a sheriff's office or, or, you know, start the, the process with the bank and the subpoenaing the uh, restraining notice and all that other stuff. Um, okay. we're, we're not allowed to actually do judgment recovery in New York. So I would, I would assume that every state is different in what you're allowed to do. Is that correct? Well, I mean that I know that there's a couple of states that have issues, but it was, so what we'll end up doing in some cases, let's say the, uh, the judgment creditors run out of money and they're in dire straits. So we might step in and buy it. And, and then because we're now the owners, we can now represent ourselves oh, that's, that, and that's or, or hire law firms. And, <laughs> that's really and, genius, and then, man. Wow. Yeah. And then we, and then we, then we run with it. That's cool. So, uh, but there, there are some people who have not, um, done well with that process. They right. kind of dropped the wolf ball because they didn't have the, uh, endurance to stick with it. Yeah. And it's kind of, I think down the road that might hurt some of us, but if it's done right, there's almost always a process. I mean, I've had that. I've gone into court. Right. And I've had attorneys tell me, hey, we've got, you know, we want to do a settlement. Call your client back and tell them that we'll offer this. Right. And I've said, I don't have a client. I bought the debt. I'm, <laughs> I'm the owner. I'm, so I'm the captain now. Anybody, <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. So if you want to talk to somebody, you, t- you talk to me. Uh, but they kind of create that, that client relationship there that doesn't exist. Wow. But we more and more of our work is shifting over to 
uh, you know, the buying of, of distressed debt. Uh, because if we do that, then we don't have to uh, deal with uh, issues, as many issues of right. trying to keep the client happy or not the client, the original judgment creditor. I, I would assume uh, you'd have to have some sort of capital to to get into that business. Oh, right? yeah. A lot it of upfront costs. Right? Is, right, because you have the, the capital buying it, right. then you have to uh, carry all the legal costs, yeah. the investigative costs during the whole period. And if at any point they pull the trigger and bankrupt out, you know, you lost the game. Wow. Uh, so, yeah, but at the same time, you know, there's there's still a lot of money on that side of the equation. And it sounds like day trading is fantastic. <laughs> really, right. really good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let's back it up a little bit and let, let's get back to, to um, the initial um, um process and, and, and work on this stuff. And, and everybody always uh, hears about the GLB and, and don't violate the GLB. So do, can you um, break that down and, and basically just in simple terms and uh, explain what that is and what the purpose is of it and as investigators, what we should be aware of when we're starting to do financial research? Sure. So that, that stands for the Gramm-Leach-Bliley Act. Um, and the, the, there, it's a large act, but there's the parts in there that apply to investigators is specifically de- dealt with. They had a problem years ago where some investigators would call up and they would pretext and pretend to be the subject and pretext the banks to try to get banking information. So that is outlawed. Now, it's a good way to go out of business pretty quickly if you do that. Now, I think that the banks with their know your customer laws, uh, I think that's very hard to do anyways. Uh, but so what we do, because it, we're so dependent on financial information, is we're careful with whoever we work with. So if we've got uh, uh, somebody that we're working with that, let's say the databases were fine. A lot of databases, I mean, microbills and some others, they have various financial searches you can do. And uh, they're, they're okay. I mean, they're, it's a low hit rate, but at least it is something that you can get. All the way up to vendors that claim that they can get the banking information. And anybody that, that, that does that, we tell them, you have to certify that you're gram leach compliant, right. as well as all of the privacy laws in North America. Yeah. And, and if at any point that you, you lie to us and you provide information you weren't supposed to get, then we will be pointing to exactly where you're hiding when the cops show up. Yeah. And we're not going to play that game. No, everybody needs, besides, a, needs a chair when the music stops, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're, we're not going to play that game. Right. We're going to because, uh, you know, I have to answer that. Right. And, and besides, so there's a lot of threads we can pull on anyways. For example, if I'm going after you, I could subpoena your, let's say you were renting, okay, right. and you had a car. So I, I could subpoena your landlord for copy your check that backs me into the bank. Right. I could subpoena your car payment yep. to find out. Because there's people out there that they have no personal bank accounts, but they're operating out of, let's say, old business accounts. Right. But they're operating out of their girlfriend's account. Yep. And this allows us to be able to back in and prove that. So right. there's so many ways of doing it anyways. That is not, A, it's not worth uh, playing that game of, of doing anything in the gray area. Uh, and there's so many ways of being able to do it through the courts. That's why we like post-judgment. Post-judgment gives us a lot of power. It really does, the yeah. Court, the, yeah. There's, no, there's no reason to play that game. So I, I warn anybody that's going down that path, it's it's not worth it. Yeah, and you know, it, it's, it's funny because in doing personal injury, right, and especially with motor vehicle accidents, when you have policies that have the minimum policy and you're looking at, you know, somebody either died or, or there's a heavy, heavy injury and the, the value of the case is a million dollars. But in New York, you know, there are some insurance policies that you just have to have the bare minimum, 25000 50000 if it's a death involved. And the attorney's like, before I even take this case, before I even, you know, invest my money into this, can you tell me, does the defendant have assets? And, you know, the short answer is, well, yeah, to an extent, I can't do the bank accounts because you don't have an inner judgment. But, you know, if you want to know if they have uh, cars, they own houses, you know, uh, boats, planes. Yes. Hard assets. Right. We can do that. But this bank what? account information, mm, you really need to have that inner judgment. Right. Yeah. Well, prior. Yeah. Prior, especially prior uh, you doing the pre-litigation stuff. Right. So you don't want to get into that world. It's for us, when we're done, our financial forensic report. A lot of times we've been able to develop some phenomenal information on how they how they play their game, right. but we always provide that directly to the lawyers, right? As attorney work product, yeah, attorney work product, uh, exactly. Yep. Yeah, to, to, to get it protected and and go through them. So if someone calls me up and wants to know, 
you know, hey, you want to find the bank account of my ex girlfriend or what I perceive <laughs> exactly. to be your ex girlfriend? <laughs> right. The answer is going to be excellent. You know, who's your attorney? <laughs> well, uh, you know, I don't, I don't have an attorney yet. Well, then right. I'd be wasting your money. I wouldn't want to waste your money because by the time you get the judgment, that bank account it could be changed. So, you know, call me back when you have an attorney. Can you talk to me a little bit about um, uh, marital cases? Like, what to what extent are, do you get involved with with that type of research, and what, what's okay and what's not okay? Well, I mean, for us, it's if it's a judgment because there are some judgments that have been uh, they came from a spouse that was in a payment order, or something happened as part of the settlement out of the out of the uh, divorce, and so for we just treat it like anything else. Now, on one hand, I, we won't buy them. Okay, because they're they're oh man, there's so much animosity, so much fighting. Uh, they're quick to get into hearing, and we I'm not stepping in the middle of that. Um, so that's that's one of the bigger issues as far as but be able to work with them to be able to help find out what's going on. In many cases, it's 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 a nice feeling to be able to help out somebody who somebody's trying to starve the other person to death. So uh, that's that's good to go. But we treat it just like any other judgment. We don't uh, uh, do anything different really so do you find yourself having to go in and do some forensic work when when maybe a, a divorce decree was signed and now it's a couple of years later and financial terms have changed for one of the uh ex spouses and they want to reopen up claims again and are you allowed to do that type of work or, or not really well we we are doing less and less of that i mean we have had plenty of cases we've done that with especially with couple of years later where there's a, a war or what they file where they, where they have been working up to filing for the divorce within a couple, you know, a couple of years. And the other one's like, I think they were laying the groundwork for the divorce a long, a long while back. And we had one case where the spouse asked us to be able to check. And we came back, we found a huge amount of bank accounts that the, that nobody knew about right. that had, you know, seven figures in them. And then, but on the other hand, when we went back, we told, the other party, but what about all the money you've hidden offshore? Right. And of course, they, they, <laughs> no. we're we're not we're dismissed from the meeting at that stage. But it's uh, they're just they're just so messy. Right. Um, yeah. Well, I prefer to have it, you know, treat it like anything else, and I don't, you know, go back and give them the information uh, to be able to make them whole, which is which is fine. But pre litigation, I we haven't done that for a while, and quite frankly, I'm not very excited about that because it because it's so messy yeah you can never you can't make anybody happy yeah we've yep. had cases we've had cases where we've gone and we've done scorched search we checked everything we're going back 20 years every business every piece of real estate everything we could find all the financial stuff all the transfers and we've come back and been able to confirm that what they had was the same with what we had and they've said oh so you didn't find anything and we and we said no. We confirmed <laughs> right. that there is nothing in public record, but there's nothing out there that that's weird. The person is exactly what they say they are. Yeah, but you didn't find anything different. So, in other words, they don't they don't need to pay us. Yeah, exactly. So uh, we don't want to pay you. We knew about that account. It's like no, it doesn't work. Yeah, that we way. already knew about that. <laughs> it does right? not so work they, that we, way. We call it. Yeah, we call it shooting the messenger. I want to get a giant picture, you know, painting over my desk that shows this messenger with all these arrows in their back. Because that's why I feel with, with some of those. It, right. You can't make them happy. Post-judgment, we don't have to deal with that. It's the process of finding the assets that have been moved, pulling them back, and uh, doing the recovery, which is a lot cleaner. So I, I get the benefit that I've been able to build the business enough right. where we can start to not have to take on those other cases anymore. So do you see yourself doing more surrogates type of work? Because I know I've gotten a few phone calls during COVID of cases that have been open now because somebody's dead you know, because of, of the COVID and uh, now they have to probate the estate and nobody knows where anything is or, or you know, there was a person that had been married a very short amount of time to this person and the kids wanted to make sure they knew about all the accounts if they were the, the new wife was being truthful about everything. Do you see yourself doing more of that work moving forward, uh, as I would assume there's going to be tons of surrogate work that needs to be done with a hundred and, I don't know, 117,000 well, people dead now or something like that. Yeah. I think, I think we're going to see that like in the next six months because what's happening right now, the courts are closed. So all the filings for those, all those motions and you know, all the stuff that they're putting in to get those cases going, they're not going anywhere. I think what's happening is they're waiting once the courts open and then they do the washout of all their backlog. I think then we're going to get hit with all that stuff. 
But right now, because the courts are closed, nobody's doing anything. All the, right. all the lawyers we work with are all working out of their homes. Yep. Clients are, are, some of them are still in their homes. They're not, a lot of them are unemployed. So I think once that the unemployment part ends and things get back to moving, I think that's when uh, uh, all that stuff's going to start coming out. But right now, until the courts open back up, uh, it's kind of like a, a stalling. Yeah, yeah, but I, I, I think you're right, man. I think it's coming. I've, I've just seen a little bit of it so far. And these were, you know, clients I do business with already, and they, you know, said, "Hey, oh, I got this thing going on here. Can you look into this for me?" That's that's gonna be fascinating. I mean, I yeah. think this whole world of the financial stuff allows you to see behind the scenes sure. of, of how the wealthy work and how uh, business is really done right. uh, in in America. So this kind of this new phase of the stuff coming out is gonna be. I mean, it's not gonna be great as far as obviously the the tragedy, the human tragedy, but the fascination of how people behave. Because we, we have found over and over and over again, people tend to behave the same. Right. That if you say they're going to go after their asset, if you, like, a, for example, if I empty your bank account, what tends to happen is you'll never use that bank account again. You'll go and you'll, put, you'll work out of your wife's account, work out of a business account. And they'll, they'll all do that, you know, especially if they get hit with, let's say, tax liens or the government empties their bank account. But the behavior is the same. So uh, it'll be very interesting to see what happens. Uh, what comes up because of, uh, you know, how people behave under these situations. Right. Right. And you've, you've taught on this financial research, um, recently, right? It, it's something that you told well, for state associations, you've come in and done some che- teaching on this stuff too, right? Right. Our state association, our, the Colorado PI association has a spring and a fall classes that they have for, uh, they're, they're like one hour long and they have this like runs for two days straight. It's a, it's a fire hose of right. information for right. uh, new investigators or investigators that are trying to find out about new stuff. Right. In my case, it's, it's really difficult for me to be able to teach really, really in-depth stuff because I have an hour. I have an hour in the spring and an hour in the fall. So in the spring, we go through the basics. In the fall, we actually break apart cases right. and go through them and show how we actually do the work. Right. So it's uh, we are working on a uh, training institute okay. uh, for an asset analyst because I don't think there's I don't think there's enough. Yeah, right. out there, and I think there's a need for it. So we're developing that. It's not ready. Probably be ready in the next six months. Right. Uh, but but the same thing with me. If I go out and I buy a large pool of judgments, uh, I'm the guy stuck in the back room. I got we got two other analysts that will work with us processing it. But I we need more people doing this. Right. And it would be good. And I think it's needed. You know, when you have somebody who ordered the judgment, eighty percent of all judgments are not collected. Wow. So. Right. So there, it, there's a problem. And the lawyers, I think, want to do their job. If I hand a law firm a checklist in the back, of a, like a back of our reports are different because they'll have a recommend, recommendations. Right. They'll say, garnish this, subpoena this, here are the third-party targets, bring them in, find out what they did with the vote. And once the attorneys have that, you know, they're, they can go loose and, and be able to do their job, which they're very good at. Right. We can do what we're good at. Right. Uh, but it's, it's definitely needed out there. I can't wait to be able to see that, that void get filled. Right. Yeah. That's, it's fascinating stuff. So what kind of advice would you give to, uh, the regular investigator who gets that call from that client saying, you know, I've got a judgment, uh, I need you to help me with this. Like, how would they go about starting here and, and what, what would be a good starting point and give me some do's and don'ts. Wow, that's a really good question. So it depends on the size of it. Okay, and I'd have to say if your case is over over twenty grand, if it's if it's a couple hundred thousand, a couple million, then the best thing to do is is to work with somebody like us, where we would partner with and be able to help uh, have them do their, their their part and us do our part and be able to do the recovery because there's so much law that you need to know, uh, state specific, uh, be able to work with the law firms, be able to do the recovery. It's smaller. Then it definitely gives it a great opportunity for them to, let's say, small claims cases. They're smaller cases. Phenomenal learning opportunity to be able to go into the court. Uh, and if you go through the court files, let's say, small claims cases, uh, to be able to see how they work, uh, how the process works, how, how um, you know, wage garnishments are done and how liens are done. It's a great learning experience. And the thing is, the, the pace is different. If you have a you know, let's say you a background check due for a client, that client expects it within X amount of days, right? Whereas post judgment enforcement work is much slower. If everything is measured in months and years, so you can take your time and learn uh, to be able to do that. There's nothing better than going through case files and be able to see because the pattern repeats itself. 
but it's it's learnable. I'd have to go to a, a law library. There is uh, law libraries that point to the post judgment enforcement uh, books booklets they have for classes for lawyers, which are state specific, and you can learn from there. So it's a it, it is not a something you're going to pick up in a weekend, but it's definitely an opportunity where investigators can add that on. There's lots of need for that. That they take their time, you know, they could definitely learn that. Right. All right. This is all good stuff, man. I really appreciate you coming on here. So tell me how, um, how can folks get a hold of you if you have any further questions? You can send me an email, rod at recoveryanalytics.net, not .com, .net. Um, it's best to do it by email because we spend so much time in court or out of the office uh, doing the work that we do. So it's the best way for us to communicate with us. We have a website, the uh, recoveryanalytics.net. It's really just a placeholder site for uh, people to be able to go and get the, the email and stuff. We actually don't need to do any real advertising because of the work we do. Right. We get more than enough referral work and uh, client work in that we don't need that. That's, a, that's one of the advantages of being in this field. There's such a need for it. They're oh, yeah. literally trying to hunt you down where, versus you trying to hunt them down. Well, yeah, that's why I wanted to have you on here today, man. I had to hunt you down to, to talk about this stuff because it's fascinating to me. And, you know, yeah, I, I mean, I let let me give you a quick example. I had sure. a, uh, an investor that came up to me and he handed me something. This was actually one of the epiphanies that had me start doing the buying side. He came up and he handed me a, a, a piece of paper on, I think it was a uh, second mortgage that was underwater. And he goes, what do I do with this? And, I, and you know, because this is like, there's not enough equity for this. So, you know, this is like worthless. And we went and did a little bit of research and I came back and said, good news. The, uh, the first mortgage looks like it's fake, but it was uh, created by the debtor to encumber the property. And, it, and uh, because their address, they go back to them, go and ask for proof of funding. And if they can't do it, have the judge remove it. You'll be in first position. It's a million, it's a million dollar property. And the guy said, wow, you just made me a million dollars. Thank you. Wow. And he walked away. And he, I didn't even get paid. <laughs> I didn't even get paid, paid for that advice. It is a favor because it was a, a client. You need to fix and that model, like, sir. <laughs> Yeah, I was like, I just made that guy a million dollars. So wow. the, the and that that's why the need is It'll, the need will always be there as long as courts are issuing judgments, as long as people are shafting other people financially. There will always, always be work for investigators to do this stuff. Yeah, you know, with the people are to do crazy things, man. That's, that's all. I've been doing this, you know, twenty something years, and I've seen some crazy, crazy stuff along the way. <laughs> Definitely tell you that's that. right. <laughs> Well, hey, Rod, this was really, really informative, man. I appreciate it. Sure. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, I hope the listeners uh, really were able to, to glean a bunch of info here. Man, I can't wait to have a, another conversation with you because we'll, we'll definitely have you back on again at, at some point to, to talk further about this Excellent. stuff. So. I, I got some great stories. I can tell you the one about the uh, Rolls Royces and all the other good stuff, but we'll save that for later. Fantastic. All right. I just want to thank everybody for tuning in and we'll catch you guys on the next show next week. Have a good one. Well, this episode could have gone another 30 minutes easy. Rod's definitely an expert when it comes to this type of research. Need help trying to recover some assets? Call Rod and tell him you heard him on the show. If you're enjoying the show and the guest, let us know by giving us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts. Drop Matt a note on LinkedIn. We appreciate all the support for the show. We also want to thank Crosstrack, Scope Now, and Investigators-Toolbox.com for sponsoring this podcast. Please, folks, check out their sites and consider using their services. Make sure you use code PIP20 for additional savings. Next week, we welcome back Sly Fox Diva Detective Brianna Joseph. Have a great week, stay safe, and thanks for tuning into PI Perspectives.